What have been uh, some of the challenges with, uh, like, we, we talk a lot about engagement in in the you know the sort of multi-platform universe, if you like, but clearly here you're actually trying to engage with uh, three-year-olds uh, who don't have credit cards. Um, how do you actually sort of manage that whole area of engagement with kids, and have you noticed a sort of increase in the level of uh, engagement with kids, uh, you know, I guess, on computers and on devices? Without question. First thing is that our brand is very, very pure. It's very interesting. We do not shirk and change, despite the size of, of what we've managed to achieve. It's all about honesty and integrity, absolutely pure honesty and integrity. Our, our theme and philosophy is, does the parent feel confident about putting their child in front of the screen with us for a period of time. And if that, the answer is yes, we're fine. So we've actually got to actually sell to the parents first. But what is really interesting for, for, for things like um, toys and consumer products, we've noticed without question what you've got there in iPad, Mark, as you know, we, we've already tested out and seen that small children, three, four years old, two years old, are engaged in that and mm -hmm. are very intuitive about it. So this is a new world for us as well. For us to think that they can do that is pretty surprising, but they are. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. Challenges with commissioning drama, with bringing in brand funding. What do you, what, you know, how are you actually then managing the, you know, the difficulties around that area? Because with factual, obviously, with the Master Chef, it's a, yeah. you know, it's a pretty straightforward sell. But with drama, particularly if you've got challenging subject matter, how did you actually manage that? Uh, well, and, and that's right. I mean, it's challenging. There's, you know, there's firsts. It's not, it's not salacious as such, but there will be firsts as first kiss. There's potentially first drugs, there's all of those sorts of things, not in an overt way, but in a way that teenagers tend to experiment. So, um, and we've been quite open with the brands. We've said this will happen, and some of them have said, okay, well, we're not in the show that that relates to. Um, we've been honest with them, and to be fair, there will be a couple of brands that want to participate on screen, and there will be probably a half a dozen brands that want to participate off screen. And we will customise their engagement. And what, what's been then your strategy for, uh, for people engaging with the content outside of the actual Foxtel subscription platform on the, in terms of are they able to access the content for free uh, on, uh, on their iPad or other devices? Ultimately what we want to do is drive people back to a subscription. That's what our model is, is subscri subscription. And there should be, we intend for there to be sufficient noise around that people start thinking, hmm, that's another reason why maybe I need to subscribe, even just to basic, because I get this and this and this. So there really is no reason economically why anybody can't, mm -hmm. if, you know. And it's look, we're using it as a driver. That's what it's there. That's what we uh, commission product for. What are the challenges for actually raising finance and finance structures in in the you know, multi-platform space in the transmedia space? There are there are loads of challenges, but they're all surmountable. And I think like any like any production. Um, you know, you need to go to multiple multiple sources to be able to raise the the um, the cash to be able to produce it. That said, I think that we are um, like I'd almost bat that away and say, look, if if it's a good enough idea, we'll get the funding for it. Um, the key thing that we're focused on is actually the revenue coming out of it. I guess there with those, if those revenue streams are, are clear uh, and uh, I guess can be measured and proven. Uh, that uh, they work, then you hopefully can find the finance for your productions. But that's still a challenge because you know if you're making an eight million dollar show, uh, it's a, it's a, you know you got to have deep pockets to pay for that yourself. Um, fortunately, Mike is in the great position of being able to uh, do this with the Wiggles. But for you know many production companies, you know stumping up that kind of money up front is is going to be difficult. It, it it is, but I think it's about being smart, really. And I guess that's why you know when I say we, we know digital, it's all we know. We're not filmmakers. We're not we're not video makers. We don't we don't, we don't tend, intend to get behind a camera on this. What we know is digital, and that's what we know in you know down to a DNA level. And and as a result, the content that we produce matches the revenue models which matches the platform and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, sort of passionate about about the importance of digital native content. Uh, I was talking about this last, last time I was here with a group of, of folks who were saying that digital content is video online. I was like you get to say no it's not. That's video online. Digital only content is a play like Club Pe Disney doing Club Penguin. That's digital only content That's and that, that works because it, it makes sense. It's no longer pointing the camera at a, at a, at a theatre stage or you, you know, doing the cinema of a train mm. coming towards the screen. 
the really strong content, the content that works is content that is, that is natively developed for its medium. And it's not a radical thing to say, it's just it needs to be acknowledged. Great. Thank you very much, Guy. Clearly, there's loads and loads of videos on YouTube that have a million views. What do you think was the key to translating those million views into what's become a multi-million dollar enterprise? I think, um, yeah, the, the good old question, what made it viral, is something that we've rattled our brains on for two years and, and still don't have full answers. I think the, the kind of, uh, the fact that it's short is, is great. The fact that it's what I call snack media, it's the sort of media you can, you can enjoy and watch whilst you're boiling a kettle or your mate's tying his shoelace. It's quick and it's fun to watch. It's comedic. I think it's kind of for all the, the weaknesses and um, you know, limitations of the animation, I think that adds to its cuteness and uh, it's got that broad sense of appeal that children can enjoy it for its pretty pictures and adults can enjoy it for its uh, poking fun at our good friends across the Tasman um, New Zealanders. So there's that... It definitely plays that, that Kiwi-Australian rivalry as well. Everyone has a mate in the office that's Kiwi that uh, you're just looking for any opportunity to get one up on. So I think that was mm -hmm. something that uh, played to a strength. Uh, on top of that, we, we kind of did uh, small seeding, but a, a lot of people picking up on it in terms of um, you know, it running on online newspapers, Flight of the Concords picking it up for their blogs and other New Zealand kind of key influencers picking up mm -hmm. on it. So those little things all sort of stack up and uh, contribute, I suppose, to getting that success. And just uh, finally, uh, I, I, I want to hear the story about what happened with Supre and the T-shirts. <laughs> it's one of the first early stages in, in the show we, uh, when we were looking to move it beyond our online store and, and license it out, we went to Supre and kind of uh, got a design up with them for them to distribute, which um, just went absolutely crazy. It ended up selling 80,000 units in three months uh, in the depths of the GFC and I don't know, maybe even uh, kept their company afloat. But, uh, you know, there was, uh, it, it sold phenomenal units. It was, you know, one of the biggest selling designs in their history. But the, the thing I loved most about it was uh, it was the first ever men's T-shirt in Supre. So many guys were going in uh, under the banner of With Their Girlfriends to buy these T-shirts and singlets that Supre actually decided to start their first men's section to the store, which was exclusively beached as T-shirts. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. What is your you know, philosophy or approach to actually working with brands in terms of integration prior to production and prior to broadcast? It, all planning, Marcus. It, it, like anything, any production needs to be planned to an inch of its life and the best productions are those that are absolutely over-planned. So we'll take our brands, some of them like X Factor that we've produced before, we know exactly what the touch points are, we know exactly the type of content that we're trying to put on screen. We build those around stories, as I said earlier. So our producers are actually looking firstly at the content, getting the content and the storytelling right, then ancillaries come off. But I'd be suggesting, I wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fair to suggest that they're thinking about commercialising content. They're thinking about telling stories. Other parts of our business, piranha-like elements, come in and uh, work through that. What, what are the greatest challenges then with telling a compelling story not on the television platform, on the mobile or internet platform for your you know, executive producers and your writing teams? Attention span. Um, there's a lot of debate that, um, that long form on handheld devices um, isn't where the market is, although the Korean market would suggest otherwise. Um, but it's getting the content right for that audience. And, and that's a very delicate fine line. And I think also everyone's still learning through that. This is a, you know, social media wasn't coined five years ago, six years ago. So uh, as content makers and as producers and storytellers, we're still trying to get that balance right. We haven't cracked the code yet. I'd love to know if anybody has. Um, so it's, it is a fine line. You know, Fremantle is a massive worldwide brand. You have some of the, you know, easily some of the best recognised uh, properties in the world. Why do you need the broadcasters? Why not? to just go out and make these shows and deliver them across other platforms and take out the television uh, factor. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have been um, espousing the demise of free-to-air television for a long time and I don't see it going anywhere. I don't see another platform, a mass media platform, coming down the road. Um, if there's one coming down the road, we haven't seen it just yet. So at the end of the day, stories and brands still need large audiences. And at the moment, the biggest place to get an audience, the biggest place for a brand to resonate, whether it's a television show or a consumer brand, is free-to-air television.
So that still is a very, very potent part of our thinking and, and I think, frankly, should be forefront in most people's mind in this room because it's not going to go away in any hurry. Great. Thanks, Ian. How will it work in the future? Properties as brands versus channels as brands. Which do you think is more powerful? Is, is there a space for the brand, for the properties to become potentially as powerful or more powerful than the channels themselves? The brand actually transcends the can transcend the channel, but at the same time, I think channels. I, I think there is a, there will continue to be a need for the role of broadcasters to curate programs and and get an ordering around content. And uh, we know that we know from research that whilst people are sitting there with a, a universe of perhaps if they've got subscription television, a couple of hundred channels, we know that people tend to watch 8, 10, 12 channels. That's by and large. Their core viewing is done on those channels. And I think they expect a, a familiarity and a coherence around those channels, and that's really what branding's all about. Um, and I think that branding is, in fact, becoming more and more important from a channel point of view. Uh, but at the same time, your brand only gets depth and resonance. You can do whatever promos you like and nice graphics, et cetera, et cetera. But your brand really gets life and resonance and depth because of the content that's within it. What are the challenges for financing new original content with the fracturing of the audience? I think the major challenge in Australia continues to be and will continue to be, uh, and it's becoming more pressing with that fragmenting of the market, is how do you fund local content because it's expensive uh, and it's always a mixture of, of regulation around numbers of channels and whether the channels have to supply a certain amount of local content. It's about government intervening with direct funding or with, with tax measures around taxation. Um, so uh, I think that, that will continue to be a challenge and it's a challenge that that the production community has to rise to in terms of being more entrepreneurial, working out how to monetise uh, content in this new, this new area we're working with, uh, working internationally where, where it's appropriate to work internationally and gathering partnerships, but also sitting at the centre of it all is the way the government actually constructs the framework that the broadcasting sits in. Great. Um, Ian, Kim, thank you very much. Uh, Telstra's obviously you know, been around I don't know how long in Australia, it'd have to be a long time. Um, you know, clearly as a, a, a telco first and foremost, uh, but you're now sort of moving into the, you've been in the media space for quite a long time with a 50% share of uh, Foxtel. Um, but the, you know, sort of what do the next five years hold for Telstra with the uh, growth of your interest in the actual um, media delivery space? Well, I think we're sort of in the process of changing ourselves from a, you know, an engineering-based telecommunications monopoly into being a, a media and marketing services company. So we're being much more customer-centric and customer-focused. Uh, I think that translates into, in terms of us becoming a media company in the future, it's going to be a clear differentiator between us and our competitors. And it is an in incredibly competitive landscape in Australia. And that's not going to get any easier. Uh, and I think, yeah, in, in five years, we'll be already actually we're, we, um, we're using content as a sort of a, a key platform in selling our other products and services. We have deals with Hopscotch and Umbrella and you know, Icon and Mad Men and other people like that. Uh, I think it's just when you sort of talk about are we, going to create, are we going to start being a content originator, we don't have the same obligations as a pay television operator as, as Fetch does to do that, but we're not averse to doing it if there's a sort of customer mm -hmm. demand. Uh, in, terms of our, in terms of our future, I think it, media is key and content is key to our future as a, as a company. Well, it's, it, uh, Australia is a tiny population relatively, 22 million people, and I guess in, in and I don't know all the competitors in this space, but clearly if, uh, yeah, if you're able to get uh, ABC iView through the, you know, through the PlayStation and um, I've already, you know, got other boxes, my Apple TV box and I might have a Nintendo and all this kind of stuff. I mean, how do you possibly compete, uh, you know, for the, the dollars of a household in that landscape? Because a household's only going to have so much disposable income available. So, I mean, I think our strategy is, is going down the triple play road. And I think what we've done is we've looked at a situation where 
70% of people up to now have not elected to take on pay TV. They may have other um, services in their house, but they haven't wanted to spend $100 a month. So I think you know, our price point is a key differentiator, um, having it be less than $30 a month for all the content and the availability of the pay-per-view movies is a fantastic offering. Um, and it's delivered on meter to your home. So as the NBN comes in, that becomes less of an issue. But I think right now, having that delivered to the box and available on the box with no over the top, no buffering, no waiting is really a USP for us. And what does the NBN actually mean for Fetch TV and I in it? I mean, it means we can deliver more content and more HD content and more 3D content. And I mean, we're a content aggregator, so our play in market is to build a fantastic consumer proposition, which we deliver to the ISPs and then they on sell to their consumers. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. And uh, thanks to the audience for coming to the Spotlight on Australia.